science, space, and technology will come to order. Uh, welcome to today's hearing entitled, Examining the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Process. I'll recognize myself for an opening statement and then the ranking member for her opening statement. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently released three working group reports on climate science focused on physical sciences, impacts and adaptation, and mitigation. These documents make up the fifth assessment report. Similarly, the White House recently rolled out its national climate assessment, which takes a closer look at climate change and policy in the U.S. Both the IPCC and the White House's documents appear, in my view, to be designed to spread fear and alarm and provide cover for previously determined government policies. The reports give the Obama administration an excuse to try and control more of the lives of the American people. The IPCC's goal is an international climate treaty that redistributes wealth among nations. The administration's goal is to impose greenhouse gas regulations, which will stifle economic growth and lead to hundreds of thousands of fewer jobs. On the heels of these catastrophic predictions, the President plans to announce next Monday his most costly climate regulations, new climate standards for power plants. The administration's regulatory agenda will hit workers and families hard but have no discernible impact on global temperature. One analysis used IPCC assumptions and found that if the U.S. stopped all carbon dioxide emissions immediately, the ultimate impact on global temperatures would only be 0 0.08 degrees Celsius by 2050. Serious concerns have been raised about the IPCC, including lack of transparency in author and study selection and inconsistent approaches to data quality, peer review, publication cutoff dates, and the cherry picking of results. Significantly, the scientists working on the underlying science for the IPCC defer to international politicians when they develop a so-called summary for policy makers. This really amounts, of course, to a summary by policy makers. The document is disseminated ahead of the actual scientific assessment and provides biased information to newspapers and headline writers around the world who gobble it up. Dr. Robert Stabbins of Harvard University, who served as a lead author for the IPCC, recently criticized this process as generating, quote, irreconcilable conflicts of interest that compromise scientific integrity. He wrote that, quote, any text that was considered inconsistent with their interest and positions in multilateral negotiations was treated as unacceptable, end quote. The bias is there for all to see. Following the 2007 assessment, key IPCC claims about the melting of Himalayan glaciers, the decline of crop yields, and the effects of sea level rise were found to be completely erroneous and derived from non-peer-reviewed sources. In 2010, the Inter-Academy Council identified, quote, significant shortcomings in each major step of IPCC's assessment process, end quote. We all know that predictions are difficult and that the only certainty about projections far into the future is that they will be wrong. Incredibly, the IPCC predicts to the year 2100 and beyond. The White House's climate assessment implies that extreme weather, hurricanes, and severe storms are getting worse due to human-caused climate change. The President claims that droughts, wildfires, and floods, quote, are now more frequent and more intense, end quote. But the underlying science from the IPCC itself shows these claims are untrue, yet the administration keeps repeating them. The President and others often claim that 97 percent of scientists believe that global warming is primarily driven by human activity. However, the study they cite has been debunked. While the majority of scientists surveyed may think humans contribute something to climate change, and I would agree. Only 1% said that humans cause most of the warming. So the President has misrepresented the study's results. We should focus on good science rather than politically correct science. The facts should determine which climate policy options the U.S. and the world considers. The IPCC and White House reports acknowledge that the U.S. has achieved dramatic reductions in admissions. 
The White House's National Climate Assessment recognized, for example, that, quote, U.S. CO2 emissions from energy use declined by around 9 percent between 2008 and 2012, end quote. U.S. contributions to global emissions are dwarfed by those of China, the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, and China shows no signs of slowing down. The Obama administration should stop trying to scare Americans and then impose costly, unnecessary regulations on them. The president says there is no debate. Actually, the debate has only just begun. When assessing climate change, we need to make sure that findings are driven by science, not an alarmist partisan agenda. That concludes my opening statement, and the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, the ranking member of this committee, is recognized for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to all. Uh, I want to join the chairman in welcoming uh, our witnesses to this morning's hearing. Today our committee will hear testimony about the process that is followed in carrying out the scientific assessments of the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I hope that today's hearing will be followed by a hearing at which scientists from the IPCC can actually present the findings of the fifth assessment because those findings are quite sobering and important for us to hear. In the meantime, while the topic of today's hearing is a legitimate one, namely how the IPCC process can be improved, I am concerned that the real objective of this hearing is to try to undercut the IPCC and to cast doubt on the validity of climate change research. For the benefit of members who were not here in 2011, I would note that we had a hearing on this same topic back then, and the testimony to be given today echoes some of the claims made then. Ultimately, however, those claims were shown to be unfounded. Yet here we are again. The reality is that the IPCC assessment is unprecedented in its scope and inclusiveness. The United States, along with 194 other nations, has arrived at a rigorous and open process that yields the most comprehensive and objective assessments of the scientific literature relevant to the understanding climate change and its associated risk. We need only look at the results of the previous assessments to realize how much the IPCC has contributed to our understanding of climate change. The latest assessment will be completed in October with the release of the synthesis report that integrates the results of each working group. Again, the IPCC's message is clear. The climate is changing. Humans are playing a significant role, and the time for meaningful action is now. All over the country, Americans are observing and reporting to a change in climate. In Texas, my home state, record droughts and other severe weather events are putting a significant strain on regional economics and presenting new challenges to the state's infrastructure and its ability to respond to these escalating threats. Developing timely solutions to these challenges is critical, and the IPCC provides policymakers with the factual basis to do just that. We are likely to hear today that political agendas distort the IPCC's summary for policymakers to make the impacts sound worse than they are or that the climate models or data uh, the scientific assessments are based on are flawed. But we know that that is not the case. In fact, if anything, the IPCC process of developing a consensus arguably results in a summary with more conservative estimates than some scientists believe are warranted. Estimates that understate the impacts of climate change. Let us be clear. The IPCC summary document is policy neutral and faithful to the underlying science. It is not a new assessment of the same information. It is not intended to be a substitute for the full assessment. Mr. Chairman, we have a responsibility to listen to the facts 
and act to protect the American people from the growing risk of change in climate. The IPCC makes clear to anyone who will listen that the science is well established and well accepted by the vast majority of climate scientists. We cannot continue to turn a deaf ear to the pleas from our constituents to start working toward solutions. This hearing is really a missed opportunity to consider the findings of the latest IPCC report and the kinds of actions the U.S. should be considering. And I, and as I stated earlier, I hope that we will have such a hearing in the coming months. In closing, I'm committed to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to develop policies that address these new climate realities. But we are going to, we are not going to get very far if we spend our time continually revisiting a scientific debate that has already been settled. Nor will we get far if we continue to continue a recent practice on this committee of seeing seeming to question the trustworthiness and integrity of this nation's scientific researchers. That does them a disservice and does not reflect well on this committee. Mr. Chairman, climate change is real. Its impacts are real. And the need to act is real. I sincerely hope that we will soon be able to work together to develop constructive policies to deal with changing climate. Thank you, and I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And I'll proceed to introduce our witnesses today. Our first witness is Dr. Richard S.J. Toll, Professor of Economics at the University of Sussex and the Professor of Economics of Climate Change at the Institute for Environmental Studies at Freya University in Amsterdam. I know you've made a big effort to be here today, and that is appreciated. Now, previously, Dr. Toll was a research professor at the Economic and Social Research Institute in Dublin, the Michael Otto Professor of Sustainability and Global Change at Hamburg University, and an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Toll is ranked among the top 25 most cited climate scholars in the world. He has written over 200 journal articles and authored three books. He specializes in the economics of energy, environment, and climate. Dr. Toll has been involved with the IPCC since 1994, serving in various roles in all three working groups. Most recently, he served as a coordinating lead author in the economics chapter of Working Group 2 for the fifth assessment report. Dr. Toll received his Ph.D. in economics from the Freya University in Amsterdam. Our second witness today is Dr. Michael Oppenheimer, the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs at Princeton University. Previously, Dr. Oppenheimer served as chief scientist at the Environmental Defense Fund. Dr. Oppenheimer also was a coordinating lead author in the Risk and Vulnerabilities Chapter of Working Group 2 for the fifth assessment report. Dr. Oppenheimer received his Ph.D. in chemical physics from the University of Chicago. Our third witness today is Dr. Daniel Botkin, Professor Emeritus at the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He also teaches biology at the University of Miami. Dr. Botkin also served as a professor at Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and at George Mason University. In 1970, Dr. Botkin developed the first successful computer model of the effects of climate change on forests and species. Recently, Dr. Botkin served as an expert reviewer for the United Nations IPCC's fifth assessment report and reviewed the recently released National Climate Assessment. Dr. Botkin received his Ph.D. in biology from Rutgers University. Our final witness is Dr. Roger Pelkey, Senior Research Scientist at the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, a joint institute of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the University of Colorado at Boulder. He is also Professor Emeritus of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State University. From 1999 to 2006, Dr. Pelkey served as Colorado State Climatologist. He is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and the American Geophysical Union, where he also served on the Committee on Climate Change. Dr. Pelkey has published over 370 papers in peer-reviewed journals, 55 chapters in books, and co-edited nine books to date. Beginning in 1992, Dr. Pelkey has served in a number of capacities related to the UNIPCC, including as an expert reviewer and author. 
Dr. Pelkey received his Ph.D. in meteorology from the Pennsylvania State University. Uh, we welcome you all. Look forward to your testimony. And Dr. Toll, we will begin with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, an appropriate solution to any problem requires a good understanding of its mechanisms, its consequences, uh, and the consequences of any countermeasure. The climate problem is so complex that at the moment only the USA can mount sufficient expertise to cover the entire issue. Other countries need international collaboration through a body like the, environment, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change. <clears throat> A common understanding of the issues is probably also helpful for the international climate negotiations. I therefore favor reform of the IPCC rather than its abolition. I will focus my remarks on Working Group 2 of the IPCC because I know that one best. Working Group 2 is on the impacts of climate change. Researchers tend to study those impacts because they are concerned about climate change. Academics who research climate change out of curiosity but find less than alarming things are ignored unless they rise to prominence. In this case, they are harassed and smeared. People volunteer to work for the IPCC because they worry about climate change. Governments nominate academics to the IPCC, but we should be clear that it's often the environment agencies that do the nominating. <clears throat> All this makes that the authors of the IPCC are selected on concern as well as on competence. This shows in the fifth assessment report of Working Group 2. Uh, the summary for policymakers talks about trends in crop yields, but omits the most uh, important trend of them all, which is technological change. It shows the impacts of climate change on agriculture, assuming that farmers will not adjust their practices in the face of change circumstances. It shows that the most vulnerable country would pay some 10% of its annual income towards coastal protection, but omits that the average country, the average country would pay less than one-tenth of a percent. Uh, the SPM, the Summary for Policymakers, emphasizes the health impacts of increased heat stress, but downplays the health impacts of decreased cold stress. <clears throat> Therefore, the IPCC should investigate the attitudes of its authors and their academic performance and make sure that in the future they are more representative of their peers. If similar-minded people come together, they often reinforce each other's prejudices. The IPCC should therefore deploy the methods developed in business management and social psychology to guard against groupthink. Not all IPCC uh, authors are equal. Some hold uh, positions of power in key chapters. Others hold subordinate positions in irrelevant chapters. The IPCC uh, leadership in the past has been very adept at putting troublesome, uh, potentially troublesome authors in positions where they cannot harm the cause. That practice must end. This is best done by making sure that the leaders of the IPCC, the chairs, the vice chairs, the heads of technical support units, uh, are balanced and open-minded. The IPCC releases a major report every six years or so. That is not frequent enough to keep abreast of a fast-moving literature. A report that is rare should make a big splash, and an ambitious team wants to make a bigger splash than last time. It's worse than we thought. We're all going to die an even more horrible death than we thought six years ago. Launch, launching a big report in one go also means that IPCC authors will compete with one another on whose chapter foresees the most terrible things. Therefore, I think that the IPCC should abandon its big reports and convert to journal-style uh, assessments instead. In learned journals, uh, the editor guarantees that every paper is reviewed by experts. IPCC editors do not approach referees. Rather, they hope that the right re reviewers will show up. Large parts of the IPCC reports are therefore not reviewed at all or reviewed by people who are not field experts. Um, the IPCC should move to journal-style reviews and editors. The IPCC is best seen as a natural monopoly. Monopolies should be broken up, but natural monopolies, where the cost of duplication are greater than the uh, benefits of competition, should be tightly regulated. The clients of the IPCC, the environment agencies of the world, uh, are often also its regulators. It's time to end that cozy relationship. The climate problem is, a, is serious enough to deserve a serious international body to assess the state of knowledge. After the fourth assessment report, the Inter-Academy Council suggested useful reforms. These were by and large ignored because the recommendations came after the preparations for the fifth assessment report had already started and because few countries supported IPCC reform. It should be said, though, that the fifth assessment report of, the, of IPCC Working Group 2 is a lot better than the fourth assessment report. And the IPCC does do, does do useful things. 
The fifth assessment report shows, for instance, that the Stern Review overestimated the impacts of climate change and underestimated the impacts of climate policy. This undermines the justification of the two-degree target of the EU, the UN, and the current, assessment, uh, current administration of the USA. The fifth assessment report also shows that double regulation, say subsidies next to tradable permits, increases costs without further reducing emissions. This conclusion was in inadvertently dropped from the German translation, which is very unfortunate as double regulation is widespread in Germany. <clears throat> We need an organization that is not beholden to any government or any party uh, to anchor climate change in reality as we currently understand it. A reformed IPCC can play that role. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Toll. Dr. Oppenheimer. I'd also like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, convening these hearings because I think the subject is quite important and for inviting me to testify. The views I'm expressing are mine. They don't adhere to IPCC and they don't reflect Princeton universities either. IPCC has served a critical function in providing governments regular assessments of the consensus view in the scientific community on the state of the science of climate change. I've served as an author of every IPCC assessment report since the first one in 1990 and also one special report. I'm currently the coordinating lead author, a coordinating lead author of Chapter 19 for the Working Group 2 report. Although I found participating in IPCC to be personally and professionally rewarding, I've never hesitated to provide constructive public criticism of IPCC when I thought it was warranted. It's to IPCC's credit that those who have been critical, even severely so, are invited to continue and even enhance their participation. And I, the smears that Richard talks about do not reflect IPCC practice, nor the practice of most of the people involved in IPCC. As to author selection, names of potential authors are suggested by governments to IPCC. The U.S. has an open selection process that allows anyone to propose a name, including their own. All names are forwarded to the, by the U.S. government to IPCC, which evaluates the suggestions in light of professional expertise and the need for balance in terms of national representation, institutional affiliation, and, uh, national, and, um, and expertise. For example, most authors come from universities governments and private research institutions, but their affiliations range broadly for, uh, in the past from ExxonMobil on the one hand to Greenpeace on the other. Several studies have compared projections of IPC report, C reports to actual outcomes in the real world, providing a basis to uh, assess the claims of bias. Overall, if there is a significant bias, it reflects the professional caution of scientists. Note that the assessments by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and other major national academies around the world have arrived at judgments which are materially the same as IPCC's. As to the review process, each report consists of chapters that go through three levels of comprehensive review, further reducing the potential for bias. I am not aware of any scientific re review process which approaches IPCC's in thoroughness. For example, over 50,000 re review comments were received but from over 1,700 reviewers of the Working Group 2 report this time. Distinct from most peer-reviewed journals, the, pro the review process is fairly transparent with review comments and author responses actually posted for public uh, consumption. A key role is played by the so-called review editors who are independent experts who review the responses that the chapters make to each and every of those review comments and assure that the reviews are responded to appropriately. As for the summary for policymakers, each uh, working group report has a summary. It's attended for policymakers. Each SPM, as it's called, goes through two rounds of peer review. It's then reviewed at a plenary session with governments word by word. The objective of the approval process is to assure that it's clear and, and that it is accurate and that it's relevant to policy. The scientists who ex exercise an effective veto power over everything that goes into the SPM. Nothing can be inserted that is not scientifically accurate. But uh, um, no statement that the scientists who were present at the review session consider to be factually untrue and not representative of the science can survive. On the plus side, this process results in a clear document and importantly one that the governments accept as their own, including the U.S. In the, and including under all administrations. In this way, it is distinct from any other climate assessment performed by any other organization. On the negative side, in my view and the view of many of my colleagues, there have been occasions when government intervention 
by causing omissions have diluted IPCC findings. However, my belief is that the process on the whole has reflected what's in the reports underneath in the chapters and have made them on the whole clearer and more understandable and even in some cases more accurate. My suggestions for improving the IPCC process are similar to Richard's, more transparency, uh, publish more frequent but much briefer reports, open the plenaries to the press so that shenanigans like went on in the recent uh, plenary session of Working Group 3 are less likely to happen because the public will be watching, and experiment with other types of assessment processes like a formalized expert elicitation or the Team B approaches that the Defense Department uses. Uh, I found some of what Richard said to be a cartoon of, of, of uh, the assessment process, but we can talk about that in questions. In the end, the world needs an IPCC. IPCC needs to continually improve its performance to meet that need. Our ability to deal with the risk of climate change depends on it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oppenheimer and Dr. Botkin. Yes, I want to thank you also, Chairman Smith, for having me speak here. I think it's very important. Dr. Botkin, uh, press the uh, – Push my talk. Okay. okay. Uh, I want to thank you also, Chairman Smith, for inviting me to speak. I think this is a very important topic, and I'm glad to be here. Since 1968, I have published research on the possibility of a human-induced global warming and its potential human and ecological effects. I've spent my career trying to help conserve our environment and its great diversity of species, attempting to maintain an objective, intellectually honest, intellectually honest approach in the best tradition of scientific endeavor. I've been dismayed and disappointed in recent years that this subject has been converted into a political and ideological debate. I have colleagues on both sides of the debate and believe we should work together as scientists instead of arguing divisively about preconceived, emotionally-based positions. I was an expert reviewer of both the IPCC and the White House National Climate Assessment, and I want to state up front that we have been living through a warming trend driven by a variety of influences. However, it is my view that this is not unusual, and contrary to the characterizations by the two reports, the, these environmental changes are not apocalyptic nor irreversible. I hope my testifying here will help lead to a calmer, more rational approach to dealing with climate change and with other major environmental problems. The two reports do not promote the kind of rational discussion we should be having. I would like to tell you why. My biggest concern is that the IPCC 2014 and the White House Climate Change Assessment present a number of speculative, sometimes incomplete conclusions embedded in language that gives them more scientific heft than they deserve. The reports are scientific sounding rather than based on clearly settled facts or admitting their lack. Established facts about global environment exist less often in science than laymen usually think. The two reports assume and argue that the climate warming forecast by the global climate models is happening and will continue to happen and grow worse. Currently, these predictions are way off the reality. There is an implicit assumption in both reports that nature is in steady state that all change is negative and undesirable for all life, including people. This is the opposite of the reality. Environment has always changed. Living things have had to adapt to these changes and may require change. Many require change. The IPCC report makes repeated use of the term irreversible changes. A species going extinct is irreversible, but little else about the environment is irreversible. The report gives the impression that living things are fragile and rigid, unable to deal with change. The opposite is the case. Life is persistent, adaptable, adjustable. In particular, the IPCC report for policy bankers repeats the assertion of previous, previous IPCC reports that large fraction of species face increased extinction risks. Overwhelming evidence contradicts this assertion. Models making these forecasts use incorrect assumptions, leading to overestimates of the extinction risks. Surprisingly, few species became extinct during the past two and a half million years, a period encompassing ice ages and warm periods. The extreme overemphasis on human-induced global warming has taken our attention away from many environmental issues that used to be front and center, but have been pretty much ignored in the 21st century and demand our attention. Some of the report's conclusions are the opposite of those given in articles cited in defense of those conclusions. For example, the IPCC Terrestrial Ecosystem Report states that seven of 19 subpopulations of the polar bear are declining in number, citing in support of this an article by Von Graven and Richardson. But these authors state the contrary. 
that the, quote, decline is an illusion, unquote, quote. In addition, the White House climate assessment includes a table of 30 different ecological effects resulting from climate change, a striking list of impacts. However, I reviewed the studies cited to support this table and found that not a single one of these 30 is supported by a legitimate impact and analyzed from human-induced global warming or direct observations. Some conclusions contradict and are ignorant of the best statistically valid observations. For example, the IPCC Terrestrial Ecosystem Report states that terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems have <coughs> sequestered about a quarter of the carbon dioxide emitted in the atmosphere by human activities in the past three decades. High confidence. Having done the first statistically valid estimates of carbon storage and uptake for any er large areas of the Earth, I can tell you that estimates of carbon uptake by vegetation used by IPCC are not statistically valid and overestimate carbon storage and uptake by as much as 300 percent. The IPCC report uses the term climate change with two meanings, natural and human-induced. These are not distinguished in the text and therefore confusing. If a statement is assumed to be about natural change, then it is a truism, something people have always known and, an experience, and experienced. If the meaning is taken to be human-caused, then the available data do not support the statements. The issues I brought up in my reviews of the reports have not been addressed in their final versions with the National Climate Assessment. With the National Climate Assessment, I stated that the executive summary is a political statement, not a scientific statement. It is filled with misstatements contradicted by well-established and well-known scientific papers. Climate has always affected people and all life on Earth, so it isn't new to say it is already affecting the American people. This is just a political statement. It is inappropriate to use short-term changes in weather as an indication one way or another about persistent climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Botkin. Uh, Dr. Pelkey. Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak today. I'm going to focus on specifically one issue. Um, the IPCC Working Group 1 and National Climate Assessment reports have not adequately tested the skill of the climate models to predict changes in regional climate statistics on multiple decadal timescales when tested by using the observed human activities, including, including fossil fuel emissions, over the last several decades. Indeed, even when these models are run using observed initial conditions on decadal time periods, they have at best only very limited regional skill. The parts of the reports based on these model results is misleading the impact community and policymakers on the confidence that can be placed on regional climate impacts in the coming decades. This issue is independent of how important one has concluded is the addition of CO2 to the atmosphere. Model projection skills should be a concern and addressed regardless of one's views on mitigation and adaptation. So the summary of my major points. The 2013 IPCC report and the 2014 U.S. National Climate Assessment present a set of projections from global and downscaled regional climate models as the basis for projecting future societal and environmental impacts and thus is offered as a guide to the future for decision makers. However, these projections have not been robustly shown to be accurate guides to the future. In fact, we are unable to qu accurately quantify their reliability. The IPCC and NCA did not adequately discuss the skill run in hindcast predictions over the last several decades when the human activity, including fossil fuel emissions, are actually known. Except for limited exceptions, the models cannot predict in hindcast runs over the last several decades the temporal evolution of major atmospheric circulation features over multi-decadal time periods. And these include, for example, the El Nino, the La Nina, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and the North Atlantic Oscillation. It is these major factors which determine which regions have drought, flood, tropical cyclone tracks, and other societally and environmentally important weather events. A global average is really not that useful of a metric for these particular very important weather phenomena. The models have an even greater challenge in accurately predicting changes in statistics of these major atmospheric circulation features over multi-decadal timescales. The IPCC and the National Climate Assessment should have reported such model limitations that were available to them in the peer-reviewed literature. And I document a whole series of these papers in the peer-reviewed literature in my written testimony. Without this information, decision makers who face decisions at the regional and local scale will have a false sense of certainty about the unfolding climate future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Dr. Pelkey. I'll recognize myself for questions, and then we'll move on to the uh, ranking member. Uh, Dr. Toll, you refused to sign on to the summary for policymakers for working group two of the most recent IPCC report. You were quoted as saying, there are a number of statements that are widely cited that are just not correct, end quote. What would be some examples of those kinds of statements? Uh, I, I, I mentioned a couple of them already. Um, what the SPM says about agriculture and the impacts of agriculture, I just don't think reflects the literature or would be uh, accurate. Uh, what they say is that because of climate change, crop yields would fall by about 2% per decade. It's probably true. Um, they also say the population will probably, food demand will probably grow by 30% over the same time period, which is probably true as well. But they admit that because of technological change, crop yields have been going up. So the IPCC sort of paints this picture of imminent famine, which I don't think is supported by any evidence whatsoever. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Toll. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, I don't have a question for you, but I wanted to thank you for your suggestions as to how the IPCC uh, could be more open and transparent, and I hope they will heed your good uh, suggestions. Uh, Dr. Botkin, um, you made some head-turning statements here. Uh, you mentioned the White House uh, list of 30 impacts that not one was true. You said the polar bear population uh, uh, statements about it being declining was the opposite. Uh, they were increasing. You said the administration or the IPCC doesn't distinguish between natural and human-caused climate change, and you said it was largely a political statement. Uh, I don't know what more to ask you. That covers it pretty well, but one question I had for you was the administration's claim that extreme weather is directly uh, connected by human-induced uh, climate change. What do you think about uh, their statements in that regard? When I was a graduate student, I got to know Reed Bryson, you know, one of the great men of uh, climatology. And at that time, that was 1960, he told me that the climate had been cooling since 1940, and if present trends continued, uh, this was going to lead to a new ice age. And I was in a position to be able to write newspaper articles, so I went back to him with that as a lead story, because that was a great lead. And he thought about it and thought about it, and he said, you know, Dan, this is, uh, for, uh, this is just a 20-year weather change. We can't make that kind of extrapolation. And then in the 1980s, I worked closely with Steve Snyder, who along with Jim Hansen helped, uh, did a lot to promote our concern with global warming. And Steve and I spoke on the same platforms and often discussed things, and he always made the point that you cannot use short-term weather, meaning decadal even, uh, uh, weather changes as an index of climate change. So to assert, as the um, White House report does right at the beginning, that current climate, uh, current weather changes are the result of, uh, are due to climate changes, it is, uh, violates one of the basic principles of what, how I understand you approach climatology. And also, there's analyses that show that the changes are not out of the ordinary. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Botkin. And Dr. Pelkey, I want to put a uh, PowerPoint up on the screen here and ask you about it. Um, this shows, I believe, that even if the United States eliminated all emissions entirely, it would have almost no impact on global temperatures. But I would like for you to address the, I mean, no one thinks that's going to happen, but what if we were to cut emissions in half? Is that going to have any discernible, any appreciable effect on, on um, global temperatures or not? If you can kind of put this in perspective. And by the way, as I mentioned in my opening statement, of course, the U.S. has actually uh, cut emissions over the last several years, I think 9 percent over the last four years. We're going that direction. But even if we went further, even if we cut emissions even more, is that going to have any impact? Well, that's a really good question. I think the way to answer this question is to use those models that the IPCC uses as process studies, not as predictions, but look at sensitivities. And I think that's the kind of numbers that one produces when you insert that in the models. And um, just so that I'm clear, so if the United States were to either eliminate emissions or cut them in half or dramatically reduce them as the administration proposes, it's not going to have any discernible impact on global temperatures in the near future and perhaps even long term? 
Uh, that's true for any country, of course, that, that yes. one would do that, yes. Okay. But, um, what about um, other countries? If other countries follow the United States lead and cut their emissions, is that going to have any particular impact? Well, it would have more of an impact, of course. And again, the, the, the way to quantify this is with to, to use the models as these process tools. And I think the figure that you have up there illustrates that okay. you have to have a huge reduction in order to get a, a, right. a large impact. And again, to make my point, if the United States were to eliminate all emissions, the projection is that by 2050, it would only reduce uh, global temperatures by zero, by 0 0.08 percent. Do you agree with that? Well, I would accept your results because, I mean, I think you're presenting results from the models, and I right. think that's the kind of sensitivities they show. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pelkey. That uh, concludes my questions, and the ranking member, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for hers. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, uh, some of the testimony from the other panelists today seemed to suggest that minority views or opinions are not adequately considered as part of the IPCC process. However, in your testimony, you state that, the, that unlike the situation with many other institutions, those who have been critical, even severely so, are invited to continue and even enhance their engagement in the process. Can you please describe the inclusive nature of the IPCC process and how lead authors deal with differences in opinion? And secondly, also, it is my understanding that comments on the report can be submitted from any scientist or expert who chooses to do so, and that every comment is individually considered. Can you please describe the review process and the role of review editors in ensuring a transparent process? Uh, thank you. Yes, I can. With regard to the first question, uh, difference of opinion, I'll give you an anecdote. During the last assessment, the fourth assessment, there was a significant differences of opinion about how to, to represent what was going on in the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Both ice sheets are known to be losing ice and adding to sea level. They now uh, account for about a third of uh, sea level rise that we're seeing today. And the question was how can you, uh, what use were models in projecting that into the future? There was disagreement among the authors, disagreement across working groups. And as a result, authors met during meetings. There were about four author meetings for each working group. And they met on the side in between meetings in order to work out differences. And they exchanged a lot of email. And the final language, although it wasn't uh, adequate in my view, did reflect the fact that there were differences of opinion on this issue. Uh, I think IPCC can do a much better job of showing the full spectrum of opinion on issues by the authors, and I hope it will do so in the future. As far as the review procedure, it's actually very painful. As I said, 50,000 comments on 30 chapters, that's an average of more than 1,000 per chapter, and we have to address every single one of them. And if we fail to do so, we have these independent scientists on our neck insisting that we go back, and they actually can hold up the completion of a chapter until comments are adequately addressed. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> in um, Dr. Botkin's testimony, he characterizes IPCC process as a very large number of people doing long reviews of the scientific literature and cautions against using, as he describes it, a crowdsourcing model of information sharing. Dr. Toll also suggests that IPCC process is vulnerable to this kind of groupthink. It seems to me that consensus does not equal groupthink, uh, and that this is a mischaracterization of the process and the resulting assessments. What do you think of these claims by the two uh, witnesses? First of all, I want to say there were a number of particular scientific claims by both of them that were inaccurate, but there's no room to actually talk about all the inaccuracies right now, so let me go on and answer your question. Um, I think groupthink is a real possibility. It's been shown to occur when you have groups of people together, and I think occasionally IPCC is the victim of the scientific tendency to all be cautious at the same time. And we need to find ways to get over that. And the suggestion that Richard made and that I made of having alternative teams of scientists within IPCC looking at the same question, I think would be an improvement. But given the current structure of IPCC, I think by and large, 
the review process helps push in the right direction. So that although, you know, I can't say that there isn't any group think, I think it's minimized, but I think the process can be improved further. Uh, Dr. Toll will also suggest that leadership of the IPCC intentionally marginalizes authors that they view as troublesome by placing them in positions where they cannot harm the cause. As I understand it, um, the United States has a very open selection process in which anyone can submit their name, and all of those names are forwarded to the IPC IPCC. Can you please describe uh, the, um, how IPCC selects the authors for the assessment? Well, that comment puzzled me because Richard, who's a very smart guy, is also one of the most biggest troublemakers among uh, <laughs> authors in that he says what he thinks, which is great, and he hasn't been marginalized. He was made the co-head of a chapter. He's done it before, and he did a great job. So there is, I don't know what this cabal is about, frankly. Thank you, Matt Tyler. Uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. The gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, is recognized. Thank you very much. First, uh, and, and, and Dr. Oppenheimer, I, I don't mean this as a, 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 don't take, a, I guess you'll take it personally or not, okay? Let me just state right out. One of the things that has disturbed me most about the debate on, on uh, global warming over the years has been the tendency of people who are pushing this concept to dismiss their those who disagree with them. And uh, I mean, I remember in this committee and I remember other committees listening to the words case closed, and, uh, and which is basically trying to restrict an honest discussion rather than open an honest discussion. And just today, uh, you, for example, uh, just in passing noted that you felt your uh, colleague that his views are like cartoons. And I'm sorry, uh, that doesn't reflect a good thing to me. That, does, that is a dismissal, and you just mentioned you didn't have time enough to go through where you disagree. Most people, when they disagree with someone, at least can capsulize it in a, in a, in a time period that they've got, whether it's 15 seconds or 10 seconds where we disagree on this, rather than dismiss. And, I don't. Th I think that probably that's the thing that gets me the angriest about this whole issue of global warming is that one side, as what we as what I'm talking about, dismisses the other. Please you can feel free. Yeah, to the, on the that. Uh, cartoon remark was aimed at only one sentence that Richard spoke, which is that somehow everybody's outracing the other one to make the most extreme assessment so that their chapter will get the headline. I just don't agree with that. I think if it goes on in anybody's head, it is a cartoon of what people think, and it has no relation to how people behave. As far as the scientific facts being right or wrong, I try very hard to let everybody have their say on scientific facts, and then they can be discussed as facts. I think everyone should be listened to, but in the end, Governments have to act on evidence that the, the large majority of the scientific community believes while not dismissing the fringes, listening to them, weighing them, and making decisions. So that's my view, and I hope I, I try to behave accordingly. All right. Well, again, uh, uh, which leads one to believe that the other people on there with outside views are fringes. Uh, and again, it's an attitude that I find overwhelming among those people who are pushing the global warming or, or believe in that theory. Uh, let me just go to some of the specifics on it. Uh, I, I take it that, uh, let me just a ask the panel if you can give me yes or no. Is this, uh, uh, this 97 percent of all scientists believe that global warming is a result uh, and the global climate change is a result of human activity? Uh, is that uh, uh, accurate or inaccurate in, in, uh, from what you see from other scientists and from what you know? I guess this um, question is directed to me. First, first, let me say that I did not take any offense with the cartoon statement by, by Dr. Oppenheimer. <laughs> I had five minutes, so what can you do other than draw a few Oh, believe me, if I took offense at all the things they said <laughs> about me, I would be offended all the time. <laughs> oh, exactly. Uh, the 97% the, the uh, estimate is bandied about by basically everybody. Uh, I had a close look at what this study really did, and as far as I know, as far as I can see, this estimate just crumbles uh, when you touch it. 
None of the statements in the papers is supported by any data that, that is actually in the paper. Uh, so unfortunately, I, I mean, it's pretty clear that most of the science uh, agrees that climate change is real and, and most likely human-made, uh, but this 97% is essentially pulled from thin air. It's not based on any credible uh, research whatsoever. Let me just uh, we only I have a couple more seconds in my time period. Would you say you agree with that assessment that the 97 percent is inaccurate? I actually haven't read the paper, although I am familiar with the argument about it. But my view is similar to Richard's in the other respects, namely the lion's share of the scientific community believes that the earth is warming yeah. and that most of the warming is human made. But I will have to also point out that one of the other things that upsets me in the debate is that people who are arguing the case for global warming always refuse to answer a specific question when they know that it will not bolster the argument for global warming. You want me to comment on something I haven't read? Uh, well, I, I, I wasn't asking about something that you read. This has not been just published in one, in one article. This has been this 97 percent, this 97 percent figure has been repeated over and over and over again by such a wide variety of people that that's I'm asking about That's because there have been many science, several scientific articles that have studied what scientists have said and that come to conclusions which are similar. Whether the 97 percent is defensible or not, I really don't know. I, I would like to break in here, if I, if I may. Uh, what a scientist finds out is science. What a scientist says is opinion. And science is not a consensus activity. Science is innovative and in, invention and discovery. Now, I've spent my life looking at facts and analyzing facts. Uh, I have been concerned about global warming since 1968. And in the 1980s, it looked like the weight of evidence lent towards human-induced significant to a significant extent. And since then, it's moved against it. But it, uh, to, for me, it doesn't matter it isn't the point it's the wrong point about how how many people approve that is not science what it is is the facts the interpretation of facts and their analysis so it's the wrong metric okay uh, thank you mr warbacher this might be a good time for me with uh, without objection to put into the record an article from the wall street journal three days ago may 26 uh, the headline is the myth of the climate change 97 percent so with that objection, that will be made a part of the record. The gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, is recognized for her question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to all the witnesses. Dr. Oppenheimer, in uh, written testimony, Dr. Pil Pilkey asserts that the climate models used by the IPCC for projecting future societal and environmental impacts from climate change may not be reliable, and that by not accurately reporting the limitations of the climate models, the IPCC is giving policymakers a false sense of certainty about the climate future. Uh, it's my understanding that the climate models have improved since the previous assessment. So will you address how important are model projections to our understanding of the climate issue, and can you also discuss the current state of climate modeling. And I do have another uh, couple of questions as well. well. First of all, there are endless, and I mean endless and painful discussions in the underlying chapters about the uncertainties, which are mentioned in the summary for policymakers. Everybody is aware that projecting the f future is a fraud activity, that it can be, we can be highly inaccurate, but we have tools and we use them as best we can. The difficulty, uh, the fact of the matter is, though, that if you took the climate models and threw them away and never referred to them, there would be adequate evidence that Earth is changing, that the climate is changing, that much of that uh, change is due to human activity, and that in the past such changes have wrought very substantial impacts which would be quite threatening to society if they were left unabated. That, that evidence comes from not only observations of climate change and change uh, to ecosystems that those climate change, changes are causing, but also a very deep understanding of what are called paleoclimates, climates of a thousand, ten thousand, a million years ago. Even without the evidence for models, we know that over time, large warming has been generally associated with changes in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Those in the past were natural changes. The current changes are, by and large, faster. And the carbon dioxide levels have already reached 
a level which is above any for many million years. And, and thank you. And I do want to uh, also ask, you mentioned something about it. Can I break in and make and a I, comment? I need to finish most of my time with Dr. Bachman. Okay, I but I do question. want to disagree. Well, because well I somebody think. else can ask you. I wanted to ask Dr. Oppenheimer again. As I, I understand that the IPCC has fairly robust guidelines on how authors are to treat uncertainty as part of the assessment. So oftentimes in this committee and in Congress, we talk about uncertainty, and it's used sometimes as a tool to discredit uh, in the field of climate science as a whole, as if any scientific theory that's less than 100 percent certain uh, should be discredited. So what role does uh, uncertainty play? How should it be considered in decision making and considering the current climate conditions and the impacts of global climate change and ocean acidification that I know many of my constituents are already beginning to experience? Can you talk about the potential risks of inaction if we were to wait for 100 percent consensus or certainty on climate change? Well, on the last point, we know that the lifetime of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, unless some genius events a way to cost-effectively remove it from the atmosphere, is very long, ranging from hundreds to even longer, hundreds of years to even longer. And about 20 percent of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere today due to human activity will still be there a thousand years from now warming the climate. So there's an irreversibility in the system. Actions or lack thereof today make a commitment to what the climate will look like 10, 50, 100, 1,000 years from now. And Dr. Oppenheimer, you suggest in your testimony that there's a way to improve transparency of the IPCC process, and that's to publish a record of significant divergent viewpoints. So Dr. Toll testified about outside challengers and that their, their advice is ignored. Uh, that's interesting because I, if there's an outside challenger, there's it, it, just because their view is not accepted does not mean they were ignored. They're considered and maybe not agreed with. But can you talk about your rationale for this ex, uh, suggestion to improve the transparency by publishing that record of divergent viewpoints? And how would that uh, contribute to the assessment as a whole? Yes, it would be healthy for everyone if everyone could measure who was saying what and what their view was. and how it diverged from what was reported as the main view or the consensus, and people could make their own judgments. You as our leaders could make your own judgments about who to listen to and whose view made sense and why and why not. Right now, there's too much, it's, it, there's too much going on behind the curtain. I would like to lift that curtain and make it more public. I want to make one comment on the irreversibility question. Uh, Dr. Bodkin says nothing is effectively irreversible. Well, if you lose ice from ice sheets and it raises sea level, that's irreversible on a time scale of 10,000 years. That's irreversible enough for me. Thank that's you. not and, actually and, irreversible. And I only have five minutes and my time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Representative Nagabar. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Dr. Pelkey, um, uh, several years ago I had an opportunity with some other science uh, committee members to go to uh, the South Pole, and obviously, as many of you know, they're doing a lot of research on climate uh, change in, in that laboratory down there as other, other subjects. But one of the scientists that we were seeing there showed me a, a, a very long a graph of the temperatures dating back thousands of years uh, and forecasting thousands of years. Uh, and uh, so that was my kind of first introduction to, to the, the models. And, and so I asked him, well, how long uh, have we been, you know, recording data? And, and so this very long graph, and, and, and the, the actually on that graph, if you looked at the time frame where we're actually recording, have, you know, data, it was a very small part of that. And so the whole uh, his whole premises was based on these models. And in your testimony, you uh, uh, includes a, an image of 120, I think, model uh, runs, including those used by the IPC and White House Climate Change for Global Temperature from 1975 to 2025. For the period of, say, 2000 to present, how many of these models have uh, been in the ballpark as uh, projected and to, to the actual? Well, that's a really good question. In terms of the global average, very few of them. But that's actually not even the complete question. The question is how well can they do on the major weather events? And in my written testimony, I document a series of papers, one of them by one of the authors of the National Climate Assessment, that says that these models can't be used for precipitation. They're, they're, they're not that good. So the reality of it is it's worse than that. 
even if they could replicate the global average in the last 14 years or so, which they haven't been able to do very well, they have not been able to predict the major weather features that affect drought and floods. And I think Michael's point was actually a good one. Uh, we don't need the models probably for that. The models, I think, are misleading us, and I think we need to recognize that. They also may be misleading us in terms of attribution, so it's a, it's a tougher problem. But we do have some information. We know that CO2 is increasing. We know that land use is changing. We know we're putting more nitrogen on the Earth's surface. We know it's a very wide range of issues we face. And I think that's how we should approach the problem in this broader perspective. And the models, unfortunately, which have, were very heavily relied on in both the IPCC and the National Climate Assessment, I think are misleading everyone in terms of the confidence we have of what's going to happen in the future. So I uh, one would don't want to put words in your mouth and so but 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 the models are being used I think to drive a lot of policy would you would you uh, I hundred percent agree with that yes yeah and so if the models aren't correct and if the models is as you say and, and Dr. Oppenheimer said that possibly they're they're irrelevant then sh should we start disregarding that and, and what what is what is a better um, metric for uh, climate policy to be made on, if not the models? Well, I, first of all, in terms of what I've recommended is that we try to develop our society so it's more resilient to weather events that have occurred in the past with today's infrastructure, or maybe worst case scenarios events, or maybe paleo record events. Try to make our society more vulnerable or more uh, resilient to them so we're not as vulnerable. That way we can protect ourselves regardless to the extent we're altering the climate in the future. To me, that's a much more inclusive approach. It should be bipartisan and everyone would benefit from that. But instead, we're relying on these models to say this is what it will be 20, 30, 40 years from now, making policy based on that, when the models clearly are not working. Could, could I add a point here? Sure. Since my field is ecology, ecosystems and species, where we learn a lot is from the paleo record, the reconstructions of climate and the history of extinctions and persistence of species. And that's where I believe the key is if we're going to look on effects. Now, Dr. Oppenheimer said it was clear that there were damaging ecosystem effects, but uh, there are changes, just as there have been changes in the past. And as I mentioned before, we looked carefully, and, and uh, in the last two and a half million years, in spite of widespread climate changes of many kinds, very few species went extinct. So it's that kind of information we need to use. I think I, just one one last question for the whole panel. In one of the observations in the in the past, speaking of the past, has the the climate in uh, on Earth been warmer and colder, uh, or, or has it always been a tr uh, one trend? Have there been periods of been where it's been colder, then warmer, then colder again? It's been colder. It's been warmer. What's distinct this time is that the ex there is an extended warming which threatens, if we keep the emissions up, to go on indefinitely at a rate which is unprecedented over an extended period. And certainly in the history of civilization, that's the case. The climate has been very stable over the last 10,000 years or so. We threaten to bring that period to an end through our emissions of the greenhouse gases. That's not correct. There's but, been but, the little ice age just, and there's it, been the okay, warming. Forgive me, for everyone on the panel and everyone here, um, because this is a back and forth, I will beg of you that when we have things we want to share, ask, have the members reach out to you. Okay. Mr. Nagabari, anything else? <clears throat> it is. Thank you, Mr. Nagabari. Mr. Stolo. Thank you, uh, Chairman. And uh, Dr. Toll, uh, you served as a convening lead author in working group two. Is that right? Correct. Who nominated you to that? Uh, the Irish government. And you noted that it is often the case that environmental agencies do the nominating, but in your case, it was not an environmental agency. Is that it right? It was the Environmental Protection Agency of Ireland. <clears throat> but it was ultimately the government's appointment? Yes. And it's correct that there were 308 total convening authors in working group two. Is that right? Um, 308 authors, yes. You were one of the 308? Correct. How many scientists in the world uh, at the time that you were appointed to that working group were working in this area of science? Can you estimate? Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. So you were in a working group, one of 308 in an area with tens of thousands of scientists? Yes. And it's your position that 
competent people have been excluded because their views do not reflect the views of government from the working group. That's correct. Yet you have views that are different from the working group, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Oppenheimer pointed out that many times you're a loud voice against the views of the majority. Is that right? That's also correct. Yet you were still included in the working yes. group. I, I, I would argue that I'm an exception, yes. Okay. And you describe in your testimony mishaps in the process, yes? Yes. And you stated that you're worried about groupthink. Is that Correct. right? And you also said that there should be protections against groupthink. Is that right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of concerns about IPCC. Safe yes. to say? Yes. And you were one of the few scientists in the whole world, one of 308, who had the privilege and honor of being at the table as these decisions were being made. That's safe to say, right? Yes. But instead of fighting within the IPCC to be a force for reform and fight against groupthink and uh, be a force uh, for the minority of views, uh, you chose to quit the working group. Is that right? Uh, no. I uh, am still a convening lead author uh, of Chapter 10 of uh, Working Group 2. I quit uh, the drafting team of the Summary for Policymakers. Okay. So you, is, you used, in your words, step down uh, from the summary of policymakers team for working group two. Yes. Were there any other scientists in working group two that uh, quit? I don't think so. You were the only one? Yes. You would agree, Dr. Toll, with the following statement, climate change is occurring and most likely caused by humans. Correct. And in fact, you wrote in June 2013, it is well known that most papers and most authors in the climate literature support the hypothesis that anthropogenic climate change, that most papers and most authors in the climate literature support the hypothesis of anthropogenic climate change. It does not matter. It does not matter whether the exact number is 90% or 99.9%. Is that right? I can't recall that exact quote, but I would agree with that statement. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Toll. And, uh, Dr. Pilkey, you stated that it would make no difference if we reduced our carbon emissions by uh, 50 percent. Is that correct? You told uh, no. I didn't say it would make no difference. It just makes it, it makes more difference if you reduce it 50 percent than if you reduce it 25 percent. No. Do you think we should uh, double our carbon emissions? Would that make any difference? You would have an effect. You'd have more. You'd have more rate of forcing if you increase CO2. I mean, it's, 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 it's you use the model. The models are the tools that you use to, to assess that, and they would tell you put more CO2 in there, you get more positive radio forcing, you take it out, you get less radio forcing. I think the problem is that you're con we're confusing when we talk about anthropogenic climate forcing, people think fossil fuels. Fossil fuels is one of them. There's a whole range of them. There was an Academy report back in 2005 that talked about broadening out this perspective. We have to look at these other things. There's black carbon, there's land use change, there's other aerosol effects. It's a more complicated problem, and I think one of the problems with the National Climate Assessment is they focus on fossil fuels. So that's what you're asking the question about, but really our impact on the environment is much broader than that. Would we be healthier and better off if we doubled our carbon emissions or reduced them by 50 percent? If we're healthier or not, I don't know about that question, but in terms of how our climate impact is, you double the CO2, you have more of a climate impact than you have half, but it's, health is not the right question because CO2 is not a pollutant uh, like a traditional Would you pollutant. prefer to live in a world that doubled its carbon emissions or one that cut them in half? Uh, that's everything else being equal, I, I, that's, a, that's, a que that's an interesting question, actually. That's well, why we brought you here. Well, that's an interesting question, but no, now I was coming here to talk about the science and some of the science issues. That's a, a, a question that's a broad range question about what is the benefits and costs of doubling or decreasing CO2. Obviously, if we have less emissions into the atmosphere, it's a positive thing. That includes aerosols, that includes um, nitrogen dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, etc. All of that is beneficial. We don't put anything in the atmosphere. We don't put anything in the ocean. But it, the reality of it is we have to try to optimize that. And I, I think we need a broad-based approach to this problem, not focusing on just one issue, which is what the question you're asking is. Thank you, Dr. Pilkey. Thank you, Dr. Toll. Thank you, Mr. Toll. I yield back to balance my time. Representative Brooks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My questions are for Drs. Botkin and Pelkey. Um, 
testimony includes an image of 102 model runs uh, done by uh, John Christie of the University of Alabama in Huntsville, uh, which is where I reside in Huntsville, including those used by the IPCC and the White House Climate Assessment for global temperature from 1975 to 2025. For the period 2000 to the present, how many of these models have accurately projected actual observed temperatures? Well, that graph was to sum them, but I also have been in contact with uh, with John Christie, and he sent me other graphs that show, in particular, how the American U U.S. based models have done, and they haven't done any better. Uh, I can't speak to all all of them. Actually, it's 102 model runs and about 34 models, but uh, even the U.S. models don't do well at all. They don't even come close. Yeah, on the figure I have in my written testimony that John Christie uh, graciously provided me, you can see that a couple of models are close to what has been observed in the last uh, 20 years, 15, 20 years, but the, by far the vast majorities have uh, overstated the, the warming. Well, why does it matter that these climate models have failed so frequently? Well, it's one of the tests of the model. I mean, if you're going to use these models to try to predict what will happen in the next several decades, you want to have some confidence that they're robust tools. And I think the models have failed to show that. In fact, I think they've been a cause for a lot of the debate and discussion. And I think what Michael was saying, you know, we don't probably need the models because the models are misleading us. They're, they're talking about a future that may not occur. It certainly hasn't shown that the models are able to replicate what's happened in the last several decades. And so you wouldn't believe a weather prediction model that was forecast for tomorrow or the next day if it kept failing all the time. I think that's what we have with these climate models. They're not ready for prime time. Models are very useful. <clears throat> they understand processes. We can help assimilate data. But as forecasting tools decades into the future, they're not ready. Mr. Bakken, do you have any, or Dr. Bakken, do you have anything to add? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, the models are well known not to be very well validated for, uh, at any level. And uh, there's work such as by S. Scott Armstrong, who's an expert on model validation, mainly for businesses, and he says that these climate models meet hardly any of the criteria for legitimate validation. And so the, you, can, you have to question the validity of the model. And I say this having worked on some of the models. I had a graduate student added vegetation to one of the climate models as his PhD thesis. Uh, so I think that uh, the models, since they are s so much failing to come close and haven't been well validated, they're not a good guide now. Well, we've used this 97 percent of scientists agree uh, kind of number. Is it fair to say that close to 100 percent of scientists agree that our models are failures? No. A lot of people, look, obviously, they don't believe they're failures because they base the uh, IPCC and the well, National Climate Assessment on it. Let me be more specific, that for the time frame from 2000 to 2014 that they have failed. I would think some would still disagree. They've been trying to explain how they can, why, they, why they're not agreeing, why there's less warming. They say now the warming has gone deeper into the ocean, for example, which obviously raises the question, if it's gone deeper in the ocean, why didn't they predict that? But uh, I think there are people that are still arguing the models are robust. Well, but, now I, I'm looking at the graphs. Is this graph accurate? Yes, the graph is accurate. Well, the and, graph and, shows that the models don't correspond with actual temperatures. So how can people contend that the models are good if they're, if they're way off base with the temperatures, with the exception of perhaps one or two out of all the models being run? That is an excellent question. But I think it's even broader than that because, as I, did in my, as I showed in my written testimony, there are a range of peer-reviewed papers that have shown when these models are run in the last several decades, they can't predict regional statistics well at all. They can't predict changes in regional climate statistics. And therefore, there's a whole range of reasons they shouldn't be accepted. But the problem is this issue is not being discussed. And it wasn't discussed in the IPCC. Let me uh, conclude with this question. Uh, former Vice President Al Gore recently gave an interview to Politico in which he stated that, quote, extreme weather events, end quote, are 100 times more common today than they were 30 years ago due to global warming. He also stated that these events are, quote, getting more frequent, more common, bigger, more destructive, end quote. Do you agree with this statement, and is it consistent with the state of the science? Mr. Uh, Dr. Bodkin first and Dr. Uh, Pelkey. The, 
there is a very good data, and Dr. Belke and his son can provide them, that show that the average rate of uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, droughts are within the, within the range of what's happened in the past. It's not extreme. And I would add that as a now resident of Florida, there hasn't been a major hurricane hit the mainland of Florida for nine years, so somehow at least us in Florida are managing our climate. <laughs> I can Dr. Pelkey? I would refer you to my son's testimony last summer to the, to the Senate. I mean, it's an area he's an expert is in, and he's commented quite a bit about the subject. There was also another analysis that showed that, that um, if you looked over the Antarctic ice core data and then compared it to the recent changes, that the recent changes in climate are not outside the ranges of past climate. There's a published paper that shows that. All right, Ms. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Toll, uh, I think you've uh, been clear about this, but I just want to make sure that uh, I've understood. Um, you would agree with the statement that climate change is caused, uh, or at least partially caused, by greenhouse gases, and that I think you said earlier most scientists agree that climate change is real. Is that true? That's true. Okay. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, um, you believe that climate is changing. I think that's a safe assumption based on your testimony, are there? Yes. Okay. Um, the majority posted a chart uh, earlier in this hearing that uh, showed by some models anyway, and we'll get to the, the reliability of those models in a second, but that the, by the end of 20, by the end of the century, that predicted, I believe it was a three degree centigrade change in global temperature. Can you color that a little bit for me? What does a three degree centigrade change in global climate temperature mean, Dr. Oppenheimer? Well, just to give you an example, already with... Uh, less than a one degree, and we're talking degrees Celsius yep. here, so double it roughly for Fahrenheit. With a change somewhat less than one degree Celsius, the uh, number of extremely hot days, and by the way, in uh, response to the last set of questions, one extreme that we're sure about that has increased are ext very hot days. Those are definitely increased. We have a lot of confidence in that. The number of such extremes, for instance, in a city like Washington, where a 90 degree day might be the, the, the hottest 10 percent of days. That, that, those number of days have already become global average. The 10 percent hottest days now represent 18 percent of days. And so we're moving to a hotter and hotter climate we, where we have more and more extremes. The sea level has been rising. Sea level has been rising primarily because Water expands when you heat it, and because ice is melting all so the time. So a three degrees change, centigrade change in global temperature, any rough prediction as to what that means for uh, sea level rise? Yeah, it means a sea level rise, which IPCC reckons will be something between about a half a foot and three feet, I think a little more, almost a foot and three feet higher than today. And just to give you a rule of thumb, on an East Coast beach, one foot of vertical sea level rise takes away in erosion and submergence, typically 100 times as much land. There's one foot up this way, 100 feet inland go away, unless you spend a heck of a lot of money defending the beaches. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Dr. Botkin, um, your testimony, written testimony, um, you say that, um, uh, I think your point one is that um, we are living through a warming trend that is driven by a variety of influences. And in, uh, part three, you say, uh, has the temperature been warming? Um, yes, we've been living through a warming trend, no doubt about that. In part five, you say our greenhouse gas is increasing, yes, CO2, rapidly. Um, you go on to say in part three, change is normal on life, or change is normal, life on Earth is inherently risky, it always has been. Doctor, do you look both ways before you cross the street? What is the relevance of that question? Uh, do you wear a seatbelt when you get in a car? Of course I do. So do you think it makes sense to mitigate against some of these changes that you indicate are in your own testimony are taking place? Uh, I think that we want... Yes or no, doctor? Yes or no? Yeah, yes or no. Okay, so restate the question. Do you think if you look both ways, if life is inherently risky, yet during the course of your daily activities you take steps to mitigate those risks, why would uh, something as, that could be as catastrophic as climate change could be, why would we not take mitigating steps? That's not a yes or no answer. There is so, no yes or no to that. That's would you suggest that we take mitigating steps or not? I, if we, that is we a yes should, or no. We, we should do adjustments. Mitigation so yes. is very unlikely to work. 
So uh, reducing carbon dioxide is unlikely to actually take place well. We I didn't, should I, adapt. So what other mitigating steps short of, if you're saying CO2 reduction isn't going to mitigate uh, climate change, what other mitigating steps would you suggest? No, I suggest that we uh, deal with the situation by reducing the uh, going back to the major issues that face us. There are nine major environmental issues that affect us all the time and are much more damaging and much riskier to us than climate change. And I would be happy to give you those, and we need to focus on those. Okay. And if we focus on those, they're either neutral or beneficial to okay. the global warming so concern. So in your opinion, Doctor, climate change is not one of the top nine greatest environmental changes we've, challenges we face? I have been working on climate change since 1968, and I think it is one of the problems we need to deal with, but we have to put it in its proper priority with those other nine. Sir, I've got eight seconds left. We should so ignore it. One question for Dr. Pelkey. Sir, you've said that humanity has had a significant effect on climate. Um, you've talked a little bit about whether the, the, the faith that we put in these models and the models, uh, but I think you said are also aren't working, and I think there's some question as to how reliable and how accurate these models are conceitedly. Um, you mentioned in your written testimony that uh, the, uh, some of the National Weather Service funding and the models that have come, been created about that have had um, enormous social value. Um, do you think those, uh, investment in those types of models is a, is a good thing? Yes, I do, and I think investment in predictability of climate models is also an excellent investment. That's so, different than providing understood, forecasts. Understood. So how would you categorize the decision to cut NOAA climate funding by 24 percent, which is what the appropriations bill that we'll be voting on this afternoon would do? I think there's an issue, what you're calling climate change, and there's climate. I'm just saying the study, the funding it's, it's, for that well, funding for Mr. Kim. Well, I can't, obviously can't answer that question unless I know exactly where the funding was going to. But if it was funding predictive models for decades in the future, I don't think that's a, a good use of funds. Thank you. I, could I could I comment a little more about your question? Mr. Botkin, actually I have to move on to oh, Mr. Fine. Kramer. Thank Mr. You. Kramer. Well, I might give Mr. Dr. Botkin a chance um, actually <laughs> to answer it because Dr. Botkin, what I would ask you as a follow-up to Representative Kennedy's question is, if wearing your seatbelt increased your likelihood of surviving a crash by 0.08 percent, but you were likely to lose your job as a result of it, would that be a good mitigation? <laughs> no, apparently, apparently not. But I always wear seatbelts, and uh, uh, because, because the because the percentages are much better than that. I, yes, yes. But look, I've written a lot about risk. In, in life and how you deal with it. I've developed a computer model of forests that has risks. But think about, uh, of course you want to deal with risks, but think about how an impala in Africa deals with risks. These animals often know when a lion is hunting them and then they'll move away. But once a kill has been made, then you'll see the grazers grazing near the lions because it's no longer a threat. So there's a book that says that's why they don't, part of the reason they don't get ulcers, you have to know when to respond to risk yeah. and what are real risks and how to deal with them. I've written a lot about them, so yeah, it's not appropriate to say just because risk is real means I mean to that you ignore it. No, you say risk is a reality. Now, where are the risks that we must reduce? Where are risks unacceptable for our human lives? And for example, right now, uh, there's huge habitat destructions. There's invasive species that are threatening the entire uh, uh, citrus crop in Florida. That's a major risk that we need to deal with now. Our fisheries are in big trouble. There are major risks with them. We want to reduce those risks. So you have to know about risks, understand how to analyze, uh, analyze it, use the math, ma mathematics and stochastic processes. Uh, you are very alert to risks. Just to say there is risk doesn't mean you ignore risk. Well, I would you learn you, how to yeah, we often don't do a cost-benefit analysis and, cr frankly, create more risks by mitigating the risks that we think we're avoiding. I, I want to get to the issue a, a little more of uh, peer review and peer pressure, if you will. And um, Dr. Pelkey, you, you referenced your son's testimony in, in the United States Senate, of course. Um, the President's Science Advisory, uh, Mr. Holden, has been critical of, of I, I think, your son's testimony and, in fact, has stated, I don't think in the context of your son's testimony, but uh, stated that anybody who disagrees with 
their premise is makes them out, themselves out to be, quote, silly. Um, perhaps you could just elaborate a little bit on how, how, what kind of a signal does that send from the top of our leadership to the scientific community that if you disagree with me, you're somehow silly? Well, it's not healthy for the scientific process. It's probably not, uh, certainly not healthy for the political process. But um, I've had my own experiences. I was asked to be on the American Geophysical Union Committee on Climate Change. And um, we put together a statement I could not agree with. It was a very, uh, I think, sort of like a national climate assessment type statement. And I wrote a minority statement on that, uh, and I put it as an appendix in my uh, testimony. But it wasn't reported in the uh, journal of the American Geophysical Union. They wouldn't publish that particular statement. And so I think there's been a chilling effect on presenting alternative perspectives and actually, I was sort of intrigued that Michael was talking about maybe the need for another team. You know, maybe there should be a red team you know, that, to try to, to come up with other perspectives challenging these reports. And maybe together we could create a better consensus than what's available now. Because now if you, if you stand up and you make a view that's different, you get either ignored or you get uh, dismissed. Well, Dr. Pelka, you make a great point. And I was very encouraged by Dr. Oppenheimer's statement about transparency, because that's what this hearing is all about. And one of the things I've found in this place is that the lack of transparency creates way more mistrust than honest discussion of even, uh, in fact, one of the things I think, you know, I, I'd rather am proud of is that I like to hear the opposing view. And if I talk to four advisors and they, they all agree with me, I try to find a fifth one. Uh, otherwise, I just don't think you have the type of robust and honest discussion that you need to get to consensus. And Dr. Toll, I'd be interested in your opinion as well on, on what happens to people who disagree, especially in the academic world. I mean, how does this peer pressure play itself out if we don't have greater transparency, more robust uh, opposing discussion? Um, <clears throat> well, people who disagree uh, on climate or on climate policy are sort of disinvited or not invited or ignored. Uh, their, their papers can get into trouble, their funding can get into trouble, they can be smeared in the media and so on and so forth. Uh, and it even goes as far as that they're personally threatened or their family is threatened. And I think that's very unfortunate and very unhealthy. I agree. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Um, Thank you, Mr. Kramer. And the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey, is recognized for questions. Or Mark, can I take it? Of course. Uh, does, I assume the gentleman from Texas will defer to the gentleman from California, Dr. Barra. And so Dr. Barra is recognized for his questions. Um, first, I want to thank my colleague from Texas um, f for that. You know, my, my thought process here, this is a fascinating hearing. Um, we agree that the climate's changing, and, and I think all of our colleagues agree that the climate is changing, and, and, and all of our witnesses certainly have um, agreed to that as well. Now, what's causing that change? We can we can debate. You know, is it cyclical? Is it natural? Is it human? For the record, I do think um, you know humans have impacted climate change, and our behaviors um, impact and are accelerating climate change. Dr. Toll, you touched on. Um, the, the danger of groupthink. And I come out of academia. I'm a um, biological scientist um, before going to medical school uh, uh, and getting my MD. And there's a danger of groupthink. Groupthink, you know, hundreds of years ago said the earth was flat. So part of advancing science, part of academia is challenging groupthink, is inviting all views um, in a non judgmental way, the scientific method requires that, that we, you know, explore and, um, you know, en engage in this, the, this debate. There's, um, you know, consensus as well. I, I'm from California. You know, the, we're going through a, an incredibly bad drought year um, this year. We have very wet years as well in my region and floods. So we know we have to, you know, when we talk about risk and mitigating risk, we have to assess risk. We have to look at how we can mitigate that risk, how we can do the things that are within our control to better manage that risk. And, you know, there's no model of predictability that's 100 percent. But, you know, we sit there and say, okay, well, it looks like it's going to be a dry year next year. Let's try to manage that risk and mitigate that risk. Maybe a wet year. But we do our best with the data that's available, and we invite that conversation. 
Um, so I think it's a, it, this is an incredibly important. We all agree the climate's changing. The objective data says the, the globe is, is getting warmer. Um, you know, we're having weather extremes. Dr. Bakken talked about impacts on agriculture, um, you know, impacts on our fisheries. So let's just acknowledge these risks and let's have an adult conversation about how we can mitigate and what we can do. Um, now my question, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, you touched on um, a, a real issue that, that does concern me. Um, you know, we already have quite a significant amount of CO2 trapped in our atmosphere. Um, and, you know, we've had our Secretary of Energy in here, and, and you also commented on how long it will take to, to um, de degrade that that hundreds of years to degrade the, the CO2 that's already trapped in our atmosphere. From your perspective within um, the, the IPCC and, and, and within the scientific community, that to me, there's an urgency in you know, advancing the science of how we might go about degrading these masses of, of um, carbon, and, and yeah, I'd pass that over to you. Yeah, I mean, what I'm concerned about, and uh, Mr. Kennedy asked me about this, is what does the world look like if you just let this keep going on and you get past three degrees? And the, the things I would worry about the most are uh, food supply, particularly in poor, low-latitude countries, uh, but also if you just let it go on indefinitely, global food supply. Uh, secondly, extreme heat, as I mentioned before. Uh, third, particularly in the context of all the other problems that humans are causing for species and ecosystems, the pressure of a rapid warming on species and ecosystems. Uh, some are already very sensitive, like coral reefs and the Arctic systems are already under threat, and that involves just also the people that depend on them, not just the, uh, the other species. And fourth, what's going to go on along the coast where we know how vulnerable our coast is. So that's the picture of the world when you get three degrees and beyond that I'm worried about. And if you look at the scenarios for how you would avoid that world, you really have to get going now with some substantial reductions in emissions. Dr. Bakken, would you want to? Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bakken has just uh, misstated some things. You know, I do work on uh, the Arctic, and I have friends, uh, colleagues who work there, including uh, Craig George, who lives up in Boulder, uh, uh, lives up at the very north end of uh, Alaska. And anyway, you wouldn't disagree that the Arctic is changing, though, would you? That ice is melting. That you know, well, we did a study in which we used the records from logbooks from whaling ships hunting the bowhead whales in the 19th century and compared it with late 20th century, and we found two things. We found that the end of winter sea ice extent was the same in the 19th century as by the end of the 20th century. But it, but it has changed over the last decades. It may have changed 200 years ago, but there's change occurring. There are changes, but it has happened in the past. In fact, the Northwest Passage has opened before. We know that because there is DNA from bowhead whales in Atlantic relatives of them, which couldn't have happened. So these kind of changes have happened in the past. And uh, th as I point out, the evidence about polar bears is uh, really negligible. Right. So there are changes. The question is whether these changes are really damaging or not, and the evidence is, is not strong that it's de damaging. I've gone over my time. So again, thank you to my colleague from Texas. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Barra. And the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, is recognized for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We were just sitting around a table, um, not drinking beer, because we know what happens then, but drinking coffee and just be able to have an extended dialogue. Um, one of my concerns is actually an odd one for a guy that's elected to Congress, is we live in a two-year cycle, politics. Um, when you deal with um, you know, other countries, you know, uh, uh, their parliamentary systems, they never know when their next election may be. We're in a political environment. You're trying to do, um, in many ways, data. Maybe not even policy, but do data. And yet, those of us in the political world, we now control so much of the money that the academic community has access to. And uh, one of my future goals here is trying to find a way to sort of separate the implied or actual sort of 
influence because, let's face it, the whole discussion here and the policy outcomes from this are stunning amounts of money to be made or to be lost, depending on the country, the industry, the technology, how people have invested. And every single member of Congress here has had someone in our office saying, please regulate this, please do this, because this is how I invest it. As my father used to say, it's about money, power, ego. And I'm finding often it's all about all three. Um, th there's actually a couple externalities here. I want to get my head around. I'll try to speak actually faster. And this is sort of open to anyone on the panel. If I walked into you and said, here's my incremental amount of money, here's $10 billion, and I want to maximize beneficial effects over the next five years, so let's do a limited time frame, would I be focusing on ACO2? Would I be focusing on invasive species? Would I be focusing? My fear is because of the size and scale of this issue, we're also, we may be heading towards a misallocation of resources. Um, doc, let's just start, Dr. Palke. Talk to me a little bit about um, my threat levels and allocations of resources and how we do sort of risk analysis. I think that's really an excellent question. That gets up to this approach that we've been proposing where it's what I call a bottom-up resource-based perspective where you try to reduce risk to your important resources. So for Arizona, for example, it's probably going to be water would be one of your big ones. How can you improve your water infrastructure so that you are robust against periods of drought? Okay. To me, that's the single probably number one item I would look Dr. at. Bucken. Yes, I, I agree. We should focus on these issues I mentioned before. Fresh water is one. Uh, we're overusing worldwide fresh water, uh, uh, and we have to reduce that. Uh, you'd be surprised to know that phosphorus for agriculture is a limited resource. There's going to be a lot of competition for that. We need to focus on that. Habitat destruction is very okay. dis destructive but, but, in many ways. But more, more where I'm heading more is conceptually is, is my ranking, because my great fear is we spend lots of time on ACO2 and issues involving yeah. there, okay. and something slips through the crack that becomes much more. I would say you want to focus on these. I'd start right now on invasive species. I, mm -hmm. I think that the climate issue should be put reduced in its priorities in favor of those okay. these kind of issues. Uh, if you were looking at limited resources in your prioritization, I'm not saying you walk away from one. What would you be right now? Within the context of the climate issue, I would balance money spent on finding ways to reduce emissions quickly and cost-effectively. Okay, but, but, even, but even outside um, climate. Um, uh, there are so many things. And, in, and uh, I know, and if I gave you a five-year window, because let's face it, we live in two-year windows, so five years of forever for us. And I said, here's my resources. Go do something great. What would you do? Climate would be a part of the picture. It wouldn't be the whole picture. And in dealing with climate, I would deal with both reducing CO2 and protecting people from climate extremes that are already happening. But, but, you, but, you would have, but, there, but there would be a variety of things on your list. Of course. Dr. Toll. Uh, for a five-year time scale and for a global perspective, I would go for golden rice. Uh, okay. That, uh, high, with, with, high, high yield. Yes. Um, High yield and vitamin A, uh, vitamin A enriched, uh, because that would save most lives in this uh, time scale. It would also reduce vulnerability to climate change. My second priority, if it were a 15-year time scale, uh, would be a malaria vaccine, which also would reduce the vulnerability to climate change, but would do much good in itself. If you're talking about 50 or 100 years time frame, then climate change will come okay. into the picture. Uh, it, it's actually amazing you said the rice, because that's actually been one of my interests. Um, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, um, j just, just a, a quick reference. Noise in the data. Um, I, I have a great interest in, oh, God, we're, we're already over time, in sampling. One, one of the noise I, we were looking at years ago was we see urban high temperatures mm -hmm. going up. But when we actually looked at where the samples were being taken of, we were seeing concrete islands, heat, heat sink islands, regeneration islands, and trying to find a methodology to adjust for that, meaning that we actually had a lot of noise in urban temperature data. That, uh, that you, part, when yeah. you work on committee, are you constantly looking for where there's these externalities that are creating noise in your data? Yeah, they're constantly looked at. And that particular one, which was interesting a couple of decades ago, has been resolved. There is an urban heat island effect. Mm -hmm. However, its effect on the global temperature trend of about 0.9 degrees Celsius over the last 100 years has only been less than 0.1 yeah, but, but, but in so recent, small. But in recent sample sets, they're still using the current temperature from those urban arees instead of doing No, the they, there are different ways it's done, and they remove those <laughs> to the 
the extent they affect the data significantly. Oh, okay. Love to look at that because I can show you some of the data sets where it wasn't adjusted for. Happy um, to yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Schweiker. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey, is recognized for his question. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have an article from the Wall Street Journal, a market watch I'd like to submit for the record. Uh, the article expresses concern and frustration with an amendment passed last week by my Republican colleagues as part of the National Defense Authorization Act, which restricts the Pentagon's use of climate science studies, including the IPCC, which we're discussing today, as part of its strategic military uh, planning. Uh, the article in the journal states that, quote, uh, GOP science deniers have crossed the line. They are now messing with national security. America is now under attack from an enemy within, irrational science, uh, denialism, a toxic mindset, a spreading self-destructive mental virus. Yes, this is war in America. The military, uh, unquote, uh, the military uh, has been using uh, uh, this uh, for this science, this climate science research for decades now, uh, and the research studies show that they are essential a part of our national defense. And, Mr. Chairman, uh, because of that, I would like to move to include this article as part of the record. Without objection, that article would be made a part of the record. And I have a question uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Botkin, uh, Dr. Excuse me if I pronounced the name wrong, Dr. Uh, uh, Pilkey and Dr. Toll. Uh, you all cite John Christie as an example of someone whose model should be considered in the IPCC process. Uh, Christie famously used uh, tropospheric temperature records from satellite data to show little evidence of warming. Uh, those results were challenged by two peers, resulting in Dr. Christie acknowledging very serious errors in his data and correcting uh, these results, which meant that his models then showed warming. Uh, somehow, since this acknowledgement in Science Magazine, uh, Dr. Christie uh, has returned to showing no significant change in global temperature. <clears throat> My question for you is which Christie models should the IPCC rely on? Could I oh, just well, let, me, let, me, let me mention that one. I, uh, John, I worked closely with John Christie. Uh, I was there when that error was discovered. It was not a major error. He corrected it, uh, and everything since then has moved forward. In fact, he actually has slightly more warming than the RSS data, which is another uh, group that analyzes these tropospheric data. These are not models. He's working with uh, satellite data, so it's not a model. His model comparisons are taking the models that are available to anyone from the, uh, from the um, IPCC. So um, John Christie's work is, is accepted as being robust by the entire scientific community. I'm not aware of anyone that is critical of what he's shown. Uh, the, uh, there is other evidence also to present about the models that I present in my written testimony that shows there are problems with the models. So which, so which models do you think that he, should, that he should be using, the ones that he retracted, the ones that are consistent no, I, I, with I, other researchers, or the ones that mysteriously are consistent with his earlier no, work? No, I have to correct that. He does, not, he does not use a model in his analysis of the tropospheric temperatures. He uses satellite data. These are observational data sets. He then compares it with model results that are computed by other people. There's a whole range of them in my written testimony that he provided to me that are the models that are used by, to create the National Climate Assessment, models that are used to create the IPCC report. So there are, that's not his model. His model is, is robust, always has been robust. It was a small error that he found and has been apparently blown out of proportion. Dr. Oppenheimer, would you please comment? Uh, there were a couple of adjustments that Dr. Christie had had to make. But I think the more important point is that if you look at the IPCC report, they actually have a lengthy discussion of the, the uh, difference between what models project and what Dr. Christie's data and other people's data project, uh, I mean, uh, show for the warming in what's called the mid-troposphere, which is only a small slice of the atmosphere over the last 35 years. And there are discrepancies, not just between the models and the data, but between different data sources. This is an area of uncertainty. It's an area that's been looked at extensively. It's an area where the uncertainties are not completely resolved, and it can't be used to undermine the credibility of the models, particularly because the observations themselves are disparate. So this is an example of where IPCC actually has this stuff in the background report, looked at it, assessed it, and will continue to do so over the next series of assessments. Could I correct Michael a little bit? Uh, the data that John Christie provided me is lower tropospheric data. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Vesey. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Brown, is recognized for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I'm a medical doctor, a physician. 
I would submit that that's a scientist, an applied scientist. It's not the same as a research scientist, obviously. But I was trained in the scientific, scientific process. And I have got some problems with some terminology that's utilized particularly by folks that are researchers, people on the other side of the aisle here. Uh, and from my scientific background, this notion of settled science to me is totally unscientific on its face. And so I'd like to start with Dr. Bodkin. Would you agree with my last statement? Absolutely. And I have run workshops on cancer research and have a lot of friends in, in medical research. And I'd like to add that I think the medical research and ecological research share a lot in common. And I agree with you completely. Yes. Uh, Dr. Pelkey, would you agree with that statement? The science is not settled, no. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer. Some things are more or less settled. Some things are not. Well, the question of whether carbon dioxide is 30 percent, 40 percent above pre-industrial times, that's settled. The question of exactly how warm the earth will become as a result, that's not settled. Well, uh, Dr. Toll. Uh, science is, of course, never settled. But uh, as, as Michael Oppenheimer says, there are spots that everybody basically agrees on and the spots of science where everybody uh, disagrees, essentially. And, well, that, and that's what we should focus on in our research, right? Well, the point of all this is the idea of settled science. Mr. Uh, Rohrbacher talked about cases closed. I heard just on the floor yesterday from members of the other party, they were talking about this very issue that is absolutely settled. It's a closed case. There's no question whatsoever that we have something called anthropogenic global warming. Now, of course, the terminology has changed from human-induced global warming to anthropogenic global warming, now to anthropogenic climate change. Climate changes all the time. Of course, it's called weather. Uh, the, uh, and the go back to the IPCC report, uh, I've seen just in medical science, in, in papers that are written, uh, there's a lot of, of um, selectivity as far as what papers are, are considered to be valid and what's not, what's published, what's not, what peer review is accepted, what is not. Um, data and assumptions and methodology all come to play in these. Wouldn't, would you all all? Could, could I comment on that? I'll, I'll come to you in just a second, Dr. Okay. Biken. Would, um, would you all agree with, with that statement? Yes. Everybody agree with that statement? Okay, Dr. Bakken, you had a comment. You know, as I said, I've worked on this since 1968, and in, by the mid-1980s, the weight of evidence, as far as I was concerned, was heavily in favor that it, there was a human-induced climate warming. Uh, and I gave talks and television interviews and uh, that said that. But since the middle of the 1990s, it, the, there is evidence that's running against that. For example, uh, the temperature change is not tracking carbon dioxide increase very well. I refer again to Christie's information. Then there's the information from the Arctic, long-term Antarctic ice cores that suggest, and from some recent papers in, in the uh, Arctic, that suggests that carbon dioxide change doesn't lead temperature change. It may actually lag it significantly or may not lag it, uh, may not lead it at all. And if that's the case, that's still an open but important scientific question. So there's several lines of evidence that are suggesting that it's a weaker case today, not a stronger case. Dr. Pelkey. Yeah, the, the question about science being settled, I think, is an interesting one. We probably should find out where there's common ground and where there's not. And I think in terms of what Michael and Richard were saying and uh, Dan was saying, CO2 is increasing. There's a human component to it. Apparently, it's not as closely connected to maybe the global temperature, but there is a biogeochemical effect from added CO2. So there are concerns. The question is, how does that fit in, ra in the other realm of concerns that we have from other human forcings of the climate and other environmental issues? And that's the science issue that's not settled. 
But if we come up to a, a, a approach where we can come to common ground on some issues, we can move forward on others where we disagree. And in terms of political action, um, maybe the, all the information is already out there to deal with it. We know CO2 is increasing, but it's, where does it fit in terms of the range of all the other threats and costs that we have? I think that's the issue that has to be resolved. And how does that fit with policymakers? Because science cannot determine policy. I completely we, agree. With, yes, we have to take science, good science, and there are a lot. Of, there's a lot of junk science out there too. Uh, we have to take good science and take that into consideration. And economic models have to come into play as far as we're concerned. And I don't think, from from a policy perspective, the what I see. Overwhelmingly, the people who want to make radical changes in public policy are liberals. And those of us who want to look at things from another perspective uh, are, are more conservative. Why is that so? Why is it that the liberals all say that we've got to, to make these huge changes that are going to affect our economy, it's going to affect job productions, et cetera, and they use IPP, IPCC reports, et cetera, to, to help bolster their claim. And then we have uh, members that try to disqualify people with dissenting views. And, and to me, that's unscientific. And uh, I think this whole discussion about settled science and, and how it's, it's all said and done, case closed, period, is totally unscientific. And I, I just encourage IPCC and those of you all who have the ability to make uh, policy decisions there, not just one dissenting view, but other dissenting views, scientific dissenting views across the board to publish those also. Mr. Well, Chairman, my time's expired. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. Dr. Bouchon, the gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, first of all, for all your valuable testimony. I was a medical doctor before coming to Congress, uh, uh, a surgeon, so. Uh, Analyzing data, analyzing studies in journals is something, of course, that you learn to do, and and you begin to realize that you know a lot of what's published is probably not accurate, um, and so uh, that's my background. Just so you, everyone knows, were there were there previous warming trends in on the Earth predating the uh, fossil fuel era of energy production? Uh, Dr. Botkin first, and then. Look. Yes, if you look at the Antarctic ice cores, they showed times where it was warmer than today. And then there, in recent times, there was the medieval warming uh, that may not have been as warm, but it was a warming trend that had a big effect on people. Uh, it was the time of exploration. So there's been warming and cooling yeah, periods. Dr. Oppenheimer? There have been warming and cooling periods. What's unique about this period is number one, the rate. Hey, and thanks. I don't. I've already okay. heard your opinion okay. on on that. The question uh, that I have, and anyone can answer it, start with Dr. Bakken, and it is, why did the climate change then? Well, why why was the temperature of the Earth warm warm then, predating? Fossil fuel use. Okay. And just so you know, I'm I'm one that does believe the temperature of the Earth is changing. As it has for centuries, I'm not one of the. I, I don't. I'm not one of the people that don't believe that there are trends, and the temperature of the Earth may very well be increasing at this time. I think the discussion is what the impact of of we are having on that versus historical temperature changes. I I can't answer the question about the cause of the medieval warming, but you do know that there's what are called the Milankovitch cycles, which has to do with the orbit of the Earth and how the Earth spins on its axis okay. that create long-term changes, 20,000, 40,000, 100,000 years. But what caused the medieval warming? I don't Dr. Pelkey first and then Dr. Oppenheim. Well, climate's always changing. Actually, the word climate change is sort of an oxymoron because climate never is, it's always varied over all different time periods. But the human activity does have an effect. CO2 adds things. But we're now recognizing there's a natural effect of large-scale warming over longer terms, probably related to cloud processes that are poorly understood. So the climate system has become more complicated as we learn more about it, and that makes it much more difficult to predict. But we know the humans have a role, and there's a natural role, and we're still trying to ferret out what the role to present. Okay, Dr. Oppenheimer? Uh, the natural climate changes occur due to the orbital changes that uh, Dr. Bodkin just noticed, which happen over tens, twenty, hundreds of thousands of years. They happen because volcanoes 
uh, reflect, uh, the dust particles reflect sunlight, but we can measure that, and we know that that's not the cause of the current warming. They happen because the strength of the sun changes. We can also measure that, have been doing so for more than 30 years. Okay. We know that's not the cause of the current warming. The only plausible cause is the human emissions of the greenhouse gases. Thanks for that opinion. I tend to uh, probably disagree, but the, it is, there's open, but all of us should have this discussion. And I want to make some comments about um, someone else was addressing the money. This is about, this issue is about money. And when you look at the state that I represent, the state of Indiana, which depends on coal for 85 to 90 percent of our power generation, this is a huge issue. And, I mean, you only have to listen to the testimony and the, the discussion from other witnesses uh, about federal funding when you, try to, when you try to not give federal funding to people that they support, what happens, how horrible that is, and, and when it, the Republican-controlled House doesn't give money to people that support the, the, the administration's position on this particular issue, you see the outrage, but... Um, and also, if you don't think um, this, is a, this is about that, also look at some of the line of questioning. And Dr. Bakken, I'd like, I'm going to apologize on behalf of Congress for the really, I think, juvenile insulting questions that you had about seat belts and other things, uh, trying to disparage the credibility of, of uh, uh, distinguished panel members, whether, no matter who that is. That's, that should not be part of the discussion. The money should not be part of the discussion. What this should be about is science, and uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we, uh, all of us, uh, on either side, whatever we believe, can stick to science. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Bouchon. And that concludes our members who had questions, and let me thank all the panelists, all the witnesses today for their testimony. I think this has been particularly helpful to us. Uh, we heard things we haven't heard before, and so the record is vastly improved because of your contribution. So thank you again, and we stand adjourned. Michael, you said... <laughs>